Willemville Stories Part 3, The Lover and the Telltale by Stephen Crane, Literature, Short Stories. The Lover and the Telltale, Willemville, Stephen Crane. When the angel child returned with her parents to New York and fond heart of Jimmy, Prescott felt its bruise greatly. For two days he simply moped, becoming a stranger to all former joys, when his old comrade yelled invitation as they swept off on some interesting quest, he replied with mournful gestures of disillusion. He thought often of writing to her, but of course the shame of it made him pause, write a letter to a girl. The mere enormity of the idea caused him shudders. Persons of his quality never wrote letters to girls, such as was the occupation of Molly Coddles and Snivellers. He knew that if his acquaintances and friends found in him evidence of such weakness and general milkiness, they would fling themselves upon him like so many wolves and bait him beyond the borders of sanity. However, one day at school, in that time of the morning session when children of his age were allowed fifteen minutes of play in the school grounds, he did not, as usual, rush forth ferociously in his games. Commonly he was of the worst hoodlums, preying upon his weaker brethren, with all the cruel disregard of a grown man, on this particular morning, he stayed in the schoolroom, with his tongue stuck from the corner of his mouth and his head twisting in a painful way. He wrote to little Cora, pouring out to her update all the poetry of his hungry soul as follows. My dear Cora, I love thee with all my heart. Oh, come back, back, back again, for all I love thee, of all, oh, come back again. When the spring come again, we'll fly, and we'll fly like a bird. As for the last word, he knew under normal circumstances perfectly well how to spell bird. But in this case, he had transposed two of the letters through excitement, supreme agitation. Nor had this letter been composed without fear and furtive glancing. There was always a number of children who, for the time, cared more for the quiet of the schoolroom than for the tempest of the playground, and there was always that dismal company who were being forcibly deprived of their recess, who were being kept in. More than one curious eye was turned upon the desperate and lawless Jimmy Trescott, suddenly taken to ways of peace, and as he felt these eyes, he flushed guiltily with felonious glances from side to side. It happened that a certain vigilant little girl had a seat directly across the aisle from Jimmy's seat, and she had remained in the room during the intermission. Because of her interest in some absurd domestic details concerning her desk, parenthetically, it might be stated that she was in the habit of imagining this desk to be a house, and at this time, with an important little frown indicative of a proper matron, she was engaged in dramatising her ideas of a household. But this small rose gold edge happened to be a family which numbered few males. It was in fact one of those curious middle class families that hold much of their ground, retain most of their position after all their visible means of support have been dropped in the grave. It contained now only a collection of women who existed submissively, defiantly, securely, mysteriously in a pretentious and often exasper exasperating Virtue, it uh, was often too triumphantly clear that they were free of bad habits. However, bad habits is a term here used in a commoner meaning. Because it is certainly true that the principal and indeed solitary joy which entered their lonely lives was the joy of talking wickedly and busily about their neighbours, it was all done without dream of its being of the vulgarity of the alleys, indeed it was simply a constitutional but not incredible chastity and honesty expressing itself in its ordinary superior way of the whirling circles of life, and the vehemence of the criticism was not lessened by further infusion of an acid of worldly defeat, worldly suffering and worldly hopelessness. Out of this family circle had sprung the typical little girl who discovered Jimmy Trescott agonisingly writing a letter to his sweetheart, of course, all the children were the most abandoned gossips, but she was peculiarly adapted to the purpose of making Jimmy miserable over this particular point. It was her life to sit of evenings about the stove and hearken to her mother and a lot of spinsters 
talk of many things. During these evenings, she was never licensed to utter an, an opinion, either one way or the other way. She was then simply a very little girl sitting open-eyed in the gloom and listening to many things, which she often interpreted wrongly. They, on their part, kept up a kind of smug-faced pretense of concealing from her information in detail of the widespread crime, which pretense may have been more elaborately dangerous than no pretense at all. Thus, all her home teachings fitted her to recognise at once in Jimmy Trescott's manner that he was concealing something that would properly interest the world. She set up a scream, Oh, 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 Jimmy Trescott's writing to his girl. Oh, oh. Jimmy cast a miserable glance upon her, a glance in which hatred mingled with despair. Through the open window, he could hear the boisterous cries of his friends, his hoodlum friends, who would no more understand the utter poetry of his position than they would understand an ancient tribal sign language. His face was set in a truer expression of horror than any of the romances described upon the feature of a man flung into a moat, a man shot in the breast with an arrow, a man cleft in the neck with a battle axe. He was succedaneous of the fullest power of childish pain. His one course was to rush upon her and attempt, by an impossible means of strangulation, to keep her important news from the public. The teacher, a thoughtful young woman at her desk upon the platform, saw a little scuffle which informed her that two of her scholars were larking. She called out sharply. The command penetrated to the middle of an early world struggle. In Jimmy's age, there was no particular scruple in the minds of the male sex against laying warrior hands upon their weaker sisters. But, of course, this voice was the throne hindered Jimmy in what might have been a berserk attack. 